Good afternoon. I'm Al McFarland. Welcome to The Conversation with Al McFarland. I'm glad to be here and glad to have you along as well. Let me uh, start by inviting you to invite everybody you know to uh, tune into this program. It's going to be a rich, robust conversation. Uh, the focus is Africa Town, and the story is a phenomenal story. We all are connected to the story in one way or another. And uh, you don't want to miss it. What I want you to do also is to subscribe to this channel. And if you're joining us on any other digital platforms, say if you're on Facebook or if you're on LinkedIn or Twitter, which we're streaming to, take a minute, take a second and scroll over to the Insight YouTube channel. Uh, we've got around 300 subscribers right now. We want to grow that to 1,000. And you taking the time to subscribe moves us in that direction. You also telling your friends, your colleagues, uh, people that you connect with, that we're doing something important here, creating community, uh, having robust conversations, uh, art articulating our point of view, our expectations, our analyses. We're building community, building futures, co-authoring the existences that we deserve and that we desire. Well, join us and thank you for being here. Spread the word. I want to start today, as we often do, with a hot topic. I have one thing uh, pulled up to share. I don't want to spend a lot of time because we've got we have such a great program and great guests today. Uh, but I want to point out that <clears throat> a new story uh, published uh, today, a couple of days ago, talks about Governor Waltz highlighting how his uh, Minnesota budget plans uh, help Black Minnesotans. And uh, this is an article uh, published, uh, I think, on what day? Um, a couple of days ago, uh, February 6th, and uh, from, uh, I think, the Minneapolis St. Paul uh, magazine. I believe that's where it comes from. But the article says, Marquita Stokes says she was convinced Governor Tim Waltz and Lieutenant Governor Peggy Flanagan wanted to do more to help the Black community, not by what they said, but what they did. And they what they did was they listened. She says, I saw that they wanted to do something positive. I wanted to be part of that, uh, said Stokes, who joined a group called mind, body, and soul that worked for the past year to identify specific things that state government could do to address the disparities affecting Black residents. Led by Stephanie Burridge, a deputy commissioner at the Minnesota Department of Education, Robert Doty, former commissioner at the State Department of Revenue, and other Black community leaders. The group started off in January of 2022 with about 130 members, and it grew to about more than 650. Uh, Barrage said Black Minnesotans wanted a consistent voice at the table. They wanted to see tangible changes and not just discussion. They wanted to see resources made available to communities at large. Uh, I'll close this just with this note. This is about the racial disparities in Minnesota. They are glaring. This article goes on to say that Minnesota has long struggled with glaring racial disparities in income, employment, educational attainment, home ownership, and more. State lawmakers have struggled to find the best ways to address those gaps. Governor Waltz called the group's input essential in his $64 billion uh, two-year budget proposal and how it expands programs to improve racial equity. The governor said it was important. Uh, the group had ownership of the process and the ideas that came out of it. Uh, he said, quote, uh, this wasn't going to be an old white guy coming into the black community saying this is how we're going to do it. And he said that uh, some of the criticisms of government, government, however, were tough to hear because that's what people were saying about it. Well, we'll stop there. You can uh, check that out. Uh, I think you can find it on insightnews.com uh, or we'll let you know where to find the story. But it's important. What's important is that right now the state has a, a $17.8 billion budget surplus. And the question we have to raise uh, to ourselves and to the state is, how do we ensure that our community uh, gets its share? We put the money in, we got to get the money out. It's about the money and it's about equity. Equity uh, can be measured in dollars.
So that's what we're talking about. Well, let me uh, shift to the main focus of today's program when I'm bringing my colleague and my friend, my companion, Dr. Irma McLaren. Uh, Dr. Irma, good to see you, my friend. And you have curated a wonderful program today. And I'll ask you to kind of co-lead with me so that we, between us, uh, cover a variety of things of importance. You and I started talking about, number one, you're in uh, Mobile right now, I believe. Or, yes. Yeah. And... Uh, I had you that I had read uh, as part of the uh, uh, in class with her on narrative.com, the Baratoon book. Uh, Baratoon, the book by Zora Neale Hurston that chronicles the story of uh, the last black cargo. Uh, and this piece was just important for all kinds of reasons. Well, you've been personally connected with Zora Neale, yes. her work. And I want to start with that. Uh, talk about why you're there and what your connection is uh, to uh, uh, Zora Neale Hurston and where we are today. And I'll have you help me introduce our two guests today. Uh, well, I'm, I'm very pleased to be here. And basically, I now have a new hashtag called Bama Roots girl. I'm in Mobile because I'm discovering my Alabama roots. My yeah. mother was born in Peachtree, which is about two hours uh, outside of Mobile. And I'm here because I have a, an uncle who is my mother's last living sibling. And so we were here uh, to, to, to work with him. And then I began to realize and hearing about the Africa town that there is such a connection to the research that I've been doing on Zora Neale Hurston for about three decades now. And she writes uh, letters to Langston Hughes from Magazine, Alabama, which is really the area that, that Africatown is located in. So I've been building upon that connection and uh, got in touch, was actually introduced to Dr. Uh, Namako, who's gonna be in the show, who's from Benin. And he is a Fulbright visiting scholar at the University of South Alabama and beginning to see these connections. And he told me about the book, uh, Remembering Africa, that we're going to be talking the, with the author about who is a descendant. So it's, it's real people talking about real things. And all of them recognize that the work that Zora Neale Hurston did was immensely important, immensely important. And that work was suppressed for years and years. Tell us about that, if you would, uh, Dr. McLaren. <clears throat> well, one of Zora's contributions is that she really elevated the cultural contributions of, of Negro people, then that's what we call them, in the American South. And in particular, she really wanted to capture and preserve the language, the linguistic contribution uh, that Black people had invented a new language. You know, we call it Ebonics. Uh, in other places, they call it Creole. But in people making the uh, connection, you know, trying to transform themselves from Africans with their own language into trying to communicate in this new world that they were, not, that they were brought to involuntarily. Uh, they're not immigrants, they were enslaved people. Hmm. But in fashioning this language, she was, she was really taken by Cujo's and Kosulo's um, remembrance and his way of speaking. And she wanted, when she wrote up her notes about him and started talking about telling his story, she did two things that were unique. One is that she took herself out of the narrative, that she felt it was really important that it be his story mm -hmm. as told to her. And the second thing is that she wanted to, main, to, to retain the linguistic integrity mm -hmm. of how he had created, you know, basically adapted by learning this new language, but also retaining aspects of Africanism of his original language. And that was the book that she sent to her publishers and they were not interested in publishing uh, something in which the, the, the cultural language of enslaved African people was the way in which it was being presented. And essentially they said, if you whiten it, if you turn it into standard English, make it acceptable, then we'll publish it. And Zora stuck to her guns. She felt that the integrity of how Caluso Cujo told his story was a critical part of it. And she said, no. And so it languished in the Library of Congress 
uh, being, I think it wasn't even copyrighted at that point. She wanted to copyright it. And she always had a, a you know, a, a challenge for having money. So it basically sat in a file until it was discovered. I think it was published again in 2018. So something like four or five, six decades after mm -hmm. she had written it, it's mm -hmm. finally seen the light of day in the original form that she had intended. So that the voice we hear is not Zora's voice, it's not made up, but it is in fact Cujo Lewis, also known as Coluso. And a powerful story indeed. Let me bring in a person connected directly to the story, but I say as we all are, uh, Brother Kojo Adisa. Uh, Brother Kojo is a native of Mobile, Alabama. He's a graduate of the University of South Alabama. Uh, he's a Navy disabled veteran. I'm a Navy veteran. We can talk about that down the road. Uh, a highly decorated and distinguished federal agent spanning two decades. He's an entrepreneur and author a former radio co-host uh, on uh, 1580 AM. And today he's a sought after public speaker sharing his insights on geopolitics, health, spirituality, community, and unity. Uh, so in his book, Re-Embracing Africa, Answering African Dreams from the Coffin Clotilda, he addresses with a passion what his ancestors endured through incarceration in Africa, the transatlantic voyage, the middle passage, we call it, and bondage in America. And uh, through this, uh, through memory and African-centered principles, uh, they were able to establish Africatown USA. Brother Kojo, good afternoon. Welcome to the conversation with Al McFarland. How are you doing, man? Hello, Brother Al. Thank you so much, Baba. Uh, I appreciate you having me on, and I appreciate the time that you're giving me to speak. Uh, if I can do one thing in way of governance, please. Yes. Um, it's an African governance, and I learned this as well through my ancestors, as well as through traveling to Africa, but um, this is your show, and I want to uh, represent well the uh, ancestry, but brother, can I have the permission to speak? Absolutely, please. Of Thank course. you. I really appreciate that. And uh, Professor uh, Irma McLaurin, I really do appreciate your time. And I so uh, completely appreciate the efforts, the time spent that you spent with uh, Zora Hurston's uh, full story. As you mentioned, um, a lot of this story would not have been captured if not for Zora Neale Hurston and the way that she documented the story. As you mentioned, um, she documented it in the language of the person she was interviewing. And she didn't so much use her own voice. And I think it was probably whatever is in the whirlwinds of the ancestors that the book came out now because it was so hard for her to get it out then. And it's important still now. So the presence of when it came out and when it was actually published, I think is very honorable. Uh, for her, for for her, uh, lent, for for her legacy, uh, excuse me, for her legacy that is that that she has, has shared. I want to say this is that uh, again, uh, as you mentioned, uh, I go by Kojo Adisa, uh, an open market for African ways of knowing. Uh, my my name given by my parents is John Bako, uh, or you can just call me John, but uh, I do go by Kojo and. The book that I drafted, of course, uh, re-embracing Africa is the, is the key word. That's what my message uh, kind of um, centers around, is re-embracing this. Uh, it's not a notion, as some people would take it. It's not a uh, idea. It is that African is African is African. And I think by the book that Zora Neale Hurston put out, it definitely resonates that that is what I used, to, my my aunts and my grandmother said, call him Uncle Kajo. And so I call him Uncle. Now we know Kosala um, was from the area of Benin or even Nigeria, but man, thank you guys for having me. Well, you in the pre pre uh, pre show conversation that we had uh, talked about for you, uh, it's critical that we discuss the 
creation of Africa Town, but really this conversation precedes that. Uh, it's about our identity, our history, our legacy as African people. Go into that if you would. Go go uh, deeper yeah. into that. Oh, absolutely. Um, so let me add to this to, to that piece. I'll jump to Africa in just one moment. Is the fact that how do I fall into this puzzle? Uh, I fall into this puzzle by lineage of my father. Mm -hmm. My father's mother, my grandmother, was the daughter to Kupalu. And a lot of will say, or sometimes you hear the name Poli, Poli Allen. Kupalu Allen is my great grandfather. He married a young lady by the name of Lucy. It would be his second wife. And he had 10 children. With inside of that 10, with inside of that uh, that those 10 children is my grandmother. Her mother, though, was, if you read the books, it's Abache. And so between Abache and Kupalu, they, they were the ones on this coffin that came from Africa to the United States. And as you mentioned, uh, Baba McFarlane, is the concept that I love to, to speak on is that we're African, our, our DNA and our essence is African. We may be in America, that's cool. And I'm not, I wouldn't challenge if you're in uh, Cuba, if you're in Canada, wherever you are, if you have the essence of an African hue, skin tone, color, well then you know that you are a piece of the homeland. And before they actually came to this land, they were doing things in Africa. They weren't just like sitting around, you know, hanging out. They were working individuals. And something that Irma just brought up is, is, is really important. I'm sorry, Professor. Uh, what, what she just brought up is when she said the way that uh, Kusala was able to take the language and then incorporate some aspects of his African language possibly, and incorporate and then speak in the English version. But one of the things I learned, which is talking about what can we do as, a, as an African way of knowing, is that when you visit Africa and you go and you meet the people, you will find that your family, your kinship in Africa, they speak at least three different languages. Mm -hmm. Now in America, we kind of, unless you go to school and you learn French or Spanish and what have you, we are only stuck kind of like with English, right? But when they came here, they probably spoke some dialect of their hometown. So most mm -hmm. in Africa, they have a home language, their community language, it might be Fawn. It might be a, an aspect of Yoruba. Uh, you know, the Iwu might say, you know, speak a little differently, but they have their language. That's number one. Two, and as you study the history of Africa, you know that the Arab, the Arabs invaded uh, Africa at one point in time. So a lot of the guys spoke Arabic, but even before the invasion, you have to realize they were traders on the territory, especially on the coastal territories. They spoke Portuguese, they, which is Spanish primarily, but that they could always do more than one thing. And that's why I always encourage other individuals, especially in America, speak more than one language. Try to get that. Because when you go to Africa, and especially when you go to those um, the the markets that they have there, oh my God, you have these guys coming up to you or, or ladies coming up to you, and they're speaking to you maybe in English, and you're like, oh my God, you speak English, but then they can flip right around and talk to the person right next to you who speaks Arabic, and mm -hmm. they can do it with ease. Just like that, yeah. And I would I would co-sign that because this is what I uh, observed when I went to the Caribbean, Curacao, which is a Dutch speaking. Uh, island uh, is an example is that I'm, I'm at the hotel desk and the clerk is speaking to me in English and then she will turn and speak to someone in Dutch and then they also have their own creolized language that they use and mm -hmm. so suddenly this one person you know who's who's not like a, 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 a foreign traveler investor but just an everyday person including the taxi drivers and they are multilingual and I think that is an aspect of something that Zora also recognized. She wasn't just a cultural anthropologist, but she was also a linguistic anthropologist. And she recognized, she was writing to Langston Hughes saying, black folk here in the South, in, in Alabama and other places are inventing language. A lot of what they did was to take descriptive adjectives like comb, 
to comb and put it together with a noun, hair, and suddenly you have hair comb, cooking pot. These terms that we now take for granted as part of the, the American vernacular were actually words that were created by Black people, not by just generic Americans. And Zorro was documenting all of this and Caluso becomes a prime example of how he's doing this as well. And so there, there are several things that are happening. It is not just him telling his story, but we are seeing the ingenuity, the adaptability, the creativity that Zora believed was very much inherent in African culture manifest itself in his story. Let me bring in our other guest today, and that's Dr. Diodone Yaman Ko who is a Beninese historian and translator, uh, born in 1963 in Cote d'Ivoire. He studied uh, in the former Soviet Union, earning his Master of Arts degree uh, in Russian philology and literature, Russian language and, uh, um, and, uh, uh, and literature. Uh, also a degree uh, in Russian French translation, uh, from the Patrice Lumumba University, uh, which was called People's Friendship University in Moscow. And he's listed as one of the 20 notable alumni since 1960 of People's Friendship University of Russia. And he's got a remarkable, amazing uh, career of accomplish accomplishment, achievement. Uh, his work has centered on African studies and the history of the African diaspora. In 1966, he published a seminal biography of the Russian military leader, uh, Abram Petrovich Ganibal. I'm saying that right, I think. And, uh, you know, <clears throat> the Russian translation coincided with the 1999 bicentennial anniversary of the birth of the writer, the famed writer, Alexander Pushkin, who was Ganibal's great grandson. His research established that Ganibal was born in Logon Birni, Central Africa, an area bordering, bordering on Lake Chad, which is now Cameroon. Well, we'll talk about that. And the question, uh, Dr. Uh, Yamaku, is how we connect uh, your study, your work, uh, the uh, the use, the power, the need to understand language and what language is and what it does in creating community and uh, creating imagination, creating facility uh, of being and how we uh, grasp that in a way that allows and encourages us to be masters of our own destiny and creators of a future in which we win. First of all, uh, brother, doctor, welcome to the program. Thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me at your program. Yes, you mentioned so many important things. And it's true that the language helps us be ourselves. Uh, the language is one of the greatest markers of our identity. So, uh, for instance, uh, my research on the African diaspora couldn't have got the success I had without the help of the languages, the help of the knowledge of the languages. For instance, when I work on uh, Russian poet of African descent, Alexander Pushkin, ancestry, African ancestry, it was three words, three words, from the African language, which was spoken by Pushkin, great grandfather, those three words would help me to determine his place of birth in Africa, in the Lake Chad area. This was the name of the, the river, the, the, where was located the city of his birth. This was the name of his sister, and the name also of the city where he was born. So it is important for us, of course, to know our languages. And in the process of the deportation of Africans and the enslavement in the Americas, the slave plantation owners did all the best 
to prevent uh, Africans not to speak the languages. They had to speak only English or Spanish or Portuguese. As Kojo was saying, Brother Kojo Adisa, author of the book, was saying a few minutes ago, most of African Americans today speak only English. So there is a kind of Creole language. We, we, at least, you know, even on, in the, through the accent, the way of speaking, the African American have the way of speaking English. So at least this way of speaking, it's a marker of a kind of resistance they had, you know, it's, it's a heritage, a legacy of the resistance during the era of the slave trade and the era of the enslavement of Africans in the Americas. And in African families, it's true that more often children will speak different languages because the mother and the father very often don't speak the same language. So ch children have to speak uh, the mother language, the father language. Mm -hmm. When you go to the market, you will have, you'll hear a new, another language. So the trade language in the markets is in many cases in another language. So automatically children speak three languages mm -hmm. and the identity of course uh, is focused is 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 um, the languages allow them to to uh, uh, the languages allow them to to define themselves to and to to know the uh, the knowledge the knowledge the ancestors has put in the languages and it's not, it's not by accident that during the colonization of Africa, the colonial powers also did everything to, to, to avoid the use of African languages in the school system until now. See, I'm speaking English uh, now. In, our, uh, in Benin, we speak French, which was a colonial language till now in the school system. So our countries are independent. It would be good to uh, learn more about Africa Town, you know, the, the naming of that space, uh, Brother Kojo. And uh, I would like you and Dr. Yamanku and Dr. Irma McLaurin to also talk about the parallel, the significance of the story of, um, of Africa Town, uh, these uh, men and women who arrived on that coffin and their uh, uh, their descendants, and relate that to your work uh, in the connecting of uh, the great Alexander Pushkin uh, to his roots in Benin or in uh, uh, Cameroon, Cameroon, right? Yes. And, and so, what what is the meaning of that, and how do we figure in both the will and the power? of the ancestors in connecting us and reconnecting us to knowledge of ourselves and how that may benefit the building of community that we currently undertake. Uh, Brother Kojo, you first, and then Dr. Irma, and then back to Dr. Yamanko. Yeah. Well, thank you for that that question. And uh, as you mentioned- and, and uh, start, with, start with Africa Town. Let's go yeah. more into Africa Town. This story is so fast, maybe. Oh yeah, that's what I was going to. Uh, so the initial uh, uh, city or town was called Plateau, mm -hmm. okay, Plateau, Alabama. Uh, and there's a unique piece about Plateau I'll get to in a moment. But Plateau, Alabama, uh, during the Civil War, the name became Magazine Point, and that's kind of what um, uh, Professor McLuhan was mentioning a little earlier. That hey, you know, the letters from Zora Hurston were from Magazine Point, but there's a reason why. I it was called Magazine Point is because that's where they had stored ammunition during the Civil War. Mm -hmm. And actually the same family that uh, commissioned this particular uh, trip, they actually uh, owned the properties that had these ammunitions on them. 
because stop, uh, stop, magazine. Stop, 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 stop there if you would. Mm -hmm. uh, let's sit with commissioned the trip. That's the backstory. So tell that first, and then we'll keep going back to where come back to this point. Okay. Well, you, you know, you have some prominent individuals who already own property, and which is a great thing. They already own land. They already own businesses. But of course, right around uh, you know the 1820s and the 1830s, when King Cotton was pretty pretty big. And of course, you still had in the United States this thing called uh, bondage. Uh, I don't like to say slaves. I say in bondage to bond, bound. But um, you have this going on. Now, we all know that there was a time and point when they said, hey, you know, you can no longer import Africans or import individuals. Let's say individuals. But mm -hmm. there was a part in the United States where uh, uh, you could still trade inside the United States. Well. I kind of denote in my in my my writing that it seems that they made a concerted effort to decide one day in 1860 that they wanted to it was cheaper for them to commission the ship send it to the west coast where they had seen in the papers that the Dahomey king had some you know some some enslaved some bondage for sale and they said hey that sounds like a pretty good idea let's do that the key to all of that is that as history would know, and you, you historians know and professors know, that you had the Anti-Slavery Act in 1807, which the United States uh, took it on in 1808. But even more important, that's where most people start with that story. But what, what, what the, the real illegal act was, because 1807, 1808 uh, act did not actually lay out what the penalty would be. It was in 1820 where the Piracy Act came into play. That's the real violation, the Piracy Act. And so Africa Town, once, so let's just say that's 1820. Now here at 1860 again, you have this uh, commission ship that goes over, uh, being uh, 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 managed by uh, Captain uh, William Foster. Uh, it does arrive in the, the coast of Benin or area called Odai or Weda, currently Weda. And Odai was where the ship uh, 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 anchored. Uh, oh, Mr. Foster and crew, you know, went to shore. They picked out the the persons that they chose to put on the ship, and some they had to leave behind because there was a schooner off 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 shore that they noticed. And uh, William Foster said, "Hey, let's uh, let's go ahead and get out of here before we're captured, and then we'll have to face some penalties." Not captured, but arrested. Arrested. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. That's right. Arrested. Well, captured would be a good term. <laughs> okay. 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 Since that's, since that's what happened to the, our ancestors, they were captured. We we were they, captured. Yeah. yeah. I'm saying they might have been arrested. Yeah. Captured yeah. would have been good, though. Captured would have been good. But so that's you know that's really the real quick story on that one. And then when they come back, and you know, they're then. You know, it was 110. Now, some say it might have been two that passed away on that particular uh, voyage, but they get to Mobile, Alabama. They get to this area. And so once they are uh, disembarked from the, the, the vessel, some of them stay in the location, which is known as Plateau, Alabama, and split up among the brothers, the Mere brothers and their other co-conspirators, the Dabneys, I think there was a Jones and what have you. They're split up. But there was a group that kind of stayed together and they bonded. And that's how, and after, okay, so they get there, they were there, 1860, 1863, emancipation, of course, you know, hey, thumbs up. Uh, in 1865 is when actually uh, Uncle Cudjo said 1865, April of 1865, that the, that the soldiers came and told them that you're free. That was in 1865. So at that point, they got together and said, hey, we're now free. They went to Mr. Muir, Timothy, the, 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 the main uh, owner, and they said, hey, now that we are free, we want you to send us back home. And then Muir said something very strange. Well, it wasn't strange because it's Alabama. He said, wait a minute, you're telling me that you want me, I've already lost property. Now, this is, I've lost property, you or my property. <laughs> I lost property and now you want me to pay for you to go back and I lose money again? He said, that's not going to happen. 
So then the willingness of the ancestors, which is very unique for me, they said, okay, they got together. They weren't discouraged, but I'm not, that's the wrong word. They were discouraged, I'm so sure, because it's in my spirit. They were discouraged. But then what they chose to do was get together and say, well, what can we do? Uh -huh. So they decided male, female, get together. We're going to have jobs. They get a little money. Now, we know it wasn't a lot of money, but they get that money, pull it together, and then they went and bought the property from Timothy Meir and his brother Jim uh, Meir, and they developed this area they called African Town. What a story. What a story. And I think it's I think it's really important about I mean these what we're seeing manifested is the entrepreneurial spirit. Their desire was to go home. And at a certain point they recognized that even if they worked, given the low wages, that they would not have enough, you know, uh resources to be able to go home. So they decide to make do, but the fact that they do it collectively. That yes. this is is they're building upon that idea of community and being part of a village, you know, all those things that we now sort of invoke when we use these African proverbs, they were actually doing it and manifesting it. And I think that that's really important, uh, the way that they got together for that. Dr. Yamanko, in your study of the diaspora, the African diaspora, this is not an uncommon experience. We have African communities throughout the Americas, in uh, Brazil, the Colombos, in uh, Peru, in, uh, I think, um, obviously, Colombia, Venezuela, uh, uh, Mexico, the Caribbean, Nicaragua. Uh, Dr. Dr. Irma has done research in Belize. Uh, talk about that. What, how common is this experience, and how does your writing about the African presence in Russia fit into this equation of who we uh, have been able to be uh, uh, and develop a sense of self? Uh, unmute, please, unmute. Thank you, sorry. Yes, what happened to millions of Africans were victims of slave raids and were forcibly deported to uh, the Americas, be it in the Caribbean, in Southern America, in Northern America. We can find distinctive, distinctive uh, patterns. And the life and achievement in the hell of enslavement, of slavery, shows that there were free men and free women who were taken, were victims of raids, and who were enslaved. So, and the way they behaved, the way they resisted, the way they fought against uh, the inhuman system uh, they were submitted to they resisted permanently, and this permanent resistance can be found everywhere. So even in, in the hell they found themselves, they had enough strength in, within themselves to, to show the enslavers that they were, if, if they could be by violence uh, physically, uh, they could be enslaved physically, but mentally, they were still free. They remained free men, free women. And we, we've seen so many examples of slave rebellions, uh, various ways of resistance in the, all over the Americas. We remember what happened in Haiti when Africans met in 1791 in August to organize the greatest slave revolution in the history of slavery. And in, in Europe, what is interesting in Europe also is that it's important to know that Africans were deported in European countries before even European came to the Americas. And those who were in uh, those who found themselves in Russia during the imperial era were in Russia through 
Another slave trade, you know, through the Ottoman Empire, and they found themselves in, in Russia. What will they do? They'll do the same thing. They'll, they'll show who they were, that as African men and women, they were free men and free women in the country, in the kingdoms. They'll show the, the strength of the tradition the strength of the culture, and they will distinguish themselves. And one of the major things they will do through even passive resistance or active resistance, be it through rebellion, be it through wars, being through attacks they will organize, the main thing they will permanently defend, ideas they will defend, was to deny, to show that all theories to, which were used to justify the enslavement were pseudo theories, were false theories. And what Alexander Pushkin ancestor will do in Russia, for instance, Abraham Hannibal was, he knew that in the system he was, he had to to, to prove his all his human capacities, abilities in all the fields, in uh, technical fields, in military fields, etc., to be recognized. So he did all his best, and he became one one of the most important figures of the history of Russia in the 18th century. And those ancestors did distinguish themselves and through that they did uh, how would you say uh, breakthrough you know and they they obliged the oppressors to look at them and to understand by themselves by the example that they were mistaken considering those people as uh, inferior human beings so, in, uh, you say, for instance, what, what could be the impact of that of, on us today? Mm -hmm. You know, there are various examples. We saw in the history of Africans who were deported in the Ottoman Empire, for instance, the women, they have kept the tradition, the spirituality and religious traditions. And Turkish women were used to go to see those African women to learn about the pro, the their own lives because you know we have in West Africa Ifa. Mm -hmm. So they had to prove that it was very important uh, as they knew they, they didn't come without anything. They had they, they, they didn't have you know suitcases of things right they had the head and in the head they had everything because and what is important for us today is to know that as africans we are the, um, we have inherited all the 300,000 uh, human history human tradition human achievement in all the areas of human life, human science, human arts, hmm. we are we we bear that we are we our ancestors have left this legacy to us. So it's important for us to remember that to remember them, and when we remember the ancestors, we also need to know how the way we have to pay tribute to them, so that they hear they hear us and they help us to continue facing the modern challenges we, we face now. I love uh, just sitting with the word remembering. And to me, uh, Dr. Yamanko, uh, the notion of remembering takes it to a, a different level. On the one hand, you say, oh, I forgot, oh, I remember. But uh, one of my teachers here in Minnesota talked in one of our programs about hearing and using the word, the concept differently. And he said, think about dismember, then think about 
remember that in history, the experience that we Africans uh, underwent at the hands of the colonizers was a dismembering of our spirits, of our body, of our story, of our lineage. And now the challenge remains, and the challenge is to remember, to reconnect. And that as we reconnect, we then can take and have a sense of sovereignty, a sense of ownership, uh, of equity, uh, as you have described, uh, Doctor, uh, understanding that we've got a 3,000 plus year experience in creating civilization. One of my first times in Africa, I think maybe, uh, I think it was 94, I went to uh, Ghana on a, 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 a student and elders uh, trip by an organization here called the Stair Step Foundation. They partnered adults with uh, teenagers to have an experience going back and learning, or not going back, but going to Ghana and connecting in community. And one of the things I took away from that first experience was there were signs all over the airport and throughout the country uh, promoting Panafest. I hadn't heard of it before, but the theme that year was uh, the rebirth of African civilization. And so that's about being conscious, right? Being intentional. And uh, thank you, Afia Zakia. She writes of Aikwe Arma, writes of remembering the dismembered continent. Yes, we must remember. So I love this conversation about memory and what memory does. And Kojo, we talk about memory as a core uh, element of the governance structure what we mean to each other and how we build futures based on knowledge and Africana way of knowing. Kojo, what do you think? Jump in here. Oh no, I, you hit the nail on the head. Uh, remembering is the key. And that's why the book is called Re-Embracing. So you remember, but now you have to embrace it. <laughs> See, the, the, the key is the, it, once you remember it, now you have to take it in and start utilizing it. That's what the ancestors want. Hey, keep moving forward. And so as a segue to just a, a short thing is when you start to remember and you start to re-embrace, then you have to start changing some of your concepts. So I don't consider myself to be a descendant. I'm an ascendant. That's what my grandmother taught me. She taught me that as a very small, she says, no, you're an ascendant. I said, well, why am I an ascendant? She said, because think about it. You were born by your mother and your father. Your mother and your father were born by their parents and their parents, they're not descending, you're ascending. Because now you take the Sankofa piece, you look back to the past and you bring forward the ideas of what your ancestors have taught you. So you should constantly be growing. So we're always growing. So you're ascending, not descending. Just like you would talk about dismemberment and rememberment, the same thing. You're not descending, you're ascending. So you want your children's children to constantly prosper and to figure out ways that they can better do it as a community and unity. Irma, jump in. Well, it, it, I, I like this idea because for me, it, it gives power to why I've created this, this Black Feminist Archive is to preserve not just the past, but to build on that. And I'll just give you an example. Uh, someone read an article about the archive and contacted me. She had a friend who's in a nursing home and this uh, elderly woman who I discovered was black had built up this library of black books. So she wanted to give them to the archive. Well, the more we started digging deep, it turns out she was at the beginning of Head Start. She's like in her mid eighties. Uh, she was at the beginning of Head Start. I found a paper in which her name is mentioned is on the as one of the authors from the 1960s. She's also what we would call she's not a formally trained artist, but she's done amazing artwork. And so I was able to get someone to interview her and talk about why did you collect those books? And in some ways, it's it's her trying to make sure that she can remember. Uh, and so suddenly this person who for all practical persons, isn't an extraordinary person, but a very ordinary person, mm -hmm. but who has this memory, this legacy that she now wants to carry on. This process of us remembering, 
in order to ascend is also the need to archive and protect because we cannot count on these institutions uh, to tell the story to tell our story. They're trying to erase us in the same way that they took away our languages. They're now saying you can't teach uh, critical race theory, which was never taught in schools anyway. But they're trying to say students should not be able to learn about African American history. And I don't think people realize, but Arizona, the state of Arizona eliminated Latino studies dec a decade ago. You know, they said you could not teach this in school. So we have to be, as, uh, you know, culture is doing, we have to be, okay, the keepers of our own memories as well as our current experiences so that there can be a future. My uh, DNA uh, places me as a Yoruba. Uh, I'm so excited to uh, have the opportunity to use this technology that allows me to remember in ways that I couldn't before. And what it says is that uh, science of DNA uh, has a secret uh, 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 power to, uh, to bring up uh, that which was hidden which was intended to be destroyed, which was intended, intended to be hidden from us forever. And now uh, with science and with uh, the study of, of genealogy, we are able to reconnect. And I, uh, uh, just as you've connected your parents in their passage on the, your grandparents, their passage on the Clotilda coffin, uh, I am discovering people here who I have a direct great 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 grandfather connection with in a place called Port Harcourt uh, mm. in, in Nigeria. And we haven't made a physical connection yet, but it'll come. The other thing that uh, is important to me about the conversation we've had is the one about language, the power of language and our capacity, our facility to uh, understand uh, language and language as part of our, our meaning making um, assets, right? We use language to make meaning of existence. And we have to examine how language has been used against us, but how we have uh, overcome and resisted, permanent resistance, Dr. Yamanko says, and the consequence of that permanent resistance is part of the continual discovery, continual creativity that we bring to each other and consequently to the world. The world suppresses uh, the, the truth of our creativity while it robs it from us. The world's system of extraction, extract our bodies from the continent of Africa, extract the minerals from the continent of Africa, extract the ideas, the genius, the creation of our people all over the globe but now we are beginning to see that for what it is. And I think in a position, uh, in the advanced position, it's a continuum of our presence all the time, our resistance is permanent, but we're able now with technology to create more, connect more, remember more, and determine that we can collaborate, create partnerships, relationships that move us forward as we define forward. I want to show one thing and then I'll come back. Uh, what we've done at my newspaper, Dr. Yuanko, is uh, created a section of the paper that we call Afro Descendientes. And I'm going to show that to you right now. Uh, this is a story about the new human rights commissioner uh, appointed by uh, President Lula in Brazil. And the point mm -hmm. I want to make is that this story, uh, its presentation in our English language newspaper is in a section that we call Afro Descendientes, but the story is repeated seven times over two pages uh, in different languages. We present it in Spanish. It's, it originates in Portuguese, the language of Brazil. We translate it into Spanish. We translate it into to French and English, but we also translate it and pre present the story in Swahili in Yoruba and in, I think, uh, Somali. Somali. And that's because there's a huge Somali presence here. Now, the question is, uh, Alan McFarland, why are you doing that? Who's gonna know all those languages anywhere, and particularly in your neighborhood in North Minneapolis? My answer is that we don't know. And my answer is that I believe that 
presenting the idea that these are the many, among the many modalities that we can use to communicate uh, will spark the idea in a five-year-old, a nine-year-old, a 20-year-old yes. linguist, and that we have to be comfortable and intentional in owning our capability and our awareness and ability to use all the modalities at our disposal. So that's my, my comment. And I wanted you, the translator, Dr. Yamanko, to re re respond to that because uh, you've seen that, I'm sure, in other places around the diaspora. Yes, indeed. Indeed, it's a very important um, it's a very important contribution to uh, understand more who we are. And when when you see in the diaspora, uh, let's take an example in Africa first. Uh, even now, people people think that we didn't have you know regional languages in Africa in the past, which is untrue. The, in West Africa, the, uh, we, we used to call one of the main languages Lukumi. Look, but Lukumi language is, in fact, the ancestor of U the Yoruba language. And the Lukumi language was spoken in all the Western African coast and the Western African central part, you know, from Nigeria through the current Benin, Togo, Ghana till Ivory Coast. So this language was spoken. And the other thing is that Africans, people don't know that, our people, Africans have invented the greatest number of uh, writing systems, of scripts, etc. And African writing systems are so different. Uh, the signs, for instance, we were talking about the memory. It's important to know that, for instance, in Vodou Convent in Benin, in the Vodou Convent of Benin, the members of the, those convents have scars on the body, and those scars are living memories, living archives of parents who were deported in the Americas. Listen, so Dr. even today, Dr. you can see that. Dr. You can, thank you can you. be given we're, that. <laughs> I hate to do this. We're out of time. Uh, we mm -hmm. have a time limit here. But thank you so much. I want to have this conversation again and build on it. Uh, Dr. Irma McLaurin, thank you, uh, my friend, for co-curating, uh, for curating this important conversation and for your work. And Brother Kojo Adisa, thank you for your work and your presence in uh, Mobile. Uh, I want to invite you, the viewers and listeners, to be with me tomorrow at one o'clock. I'm going to continue our conversation with Sister Mildred Muhammad. She is the former wife of uh, John Allen Muhammad, who was known as the uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, highway sniper, a man who uh, killed a number of people in an effort to finally murder her. She survived. But we're talking about abuse uh, in families and uh, how we survive that. It's part of our program tomorrow. It's the Healing Circle, one o'clock. Join me tomorrow. I'm Al McFarland. We'll see you then.